All right. Welcome again to another amazing episode of the Nailed It Orthopedic Podcast. Thank you, everyone, for listening in and tuning in again with us. We have another amazing episode in store for you guys. And uh, for those who happen to be coming in for the first time, this is uh, Jay Fist, and I have here with me Dr. Cole. Oh, welcome, welcome. All right. And we have Dr. Harrison with us here today as well, uh, who's going to be our guest speaker. So thank you so much for coming on to the show, sir. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Awesome. And just to kind of start things off, we always give uh, ask our guests a few just basic questions so that our listeners can kind of get to know you a little bit. So, uh, Dr. Harrison, uh, why did you choose trauma as your specialty that you uh, went into? Well, one of the things that um, I like the most about trauma is the variety uh, you get to operate on all the extremities and uh, learn about uh, the pelvis and acetabulum too. So the variety of uh, cases is always, uh, it's always something new every day. And even the, even one fracture from one person to the next, you're always, uh, everything's a little different. So I really like a, a new challenge every day. I like it. I like it. That is um, very true with trauma. Now, the second question we have is kind of a left field question, but if you could put a billboard up anywhere in the world, what would it say and where would you put it? Oh, um, that's an interesting question for sure. <laughs> um, am I supposed to be advertising myself? Yeah, if you want to, if that's what you would put up, then, you know, go for it. Well, you know, sometimes when you're on call, you feel like there's a billboard out there already that has your face <laughs> and, and your telephone number on it. Um, uh, wow. Uh, what would I say if I could, if I could put a billboard anywhere, I don't know, we would just let it go in a random place and just, uh, maybe we could just let it say, uh, be nice to everybody. It seems like we kind of need that right now. I like that. That is a, um, that is, that's something we can all take. Yeah. <laughs> and, it is, and it's something effect. really needed right now. Uh, for the last question, this is something that we, we ask most of our guests, but uh, it tends to be some of the mo more interesting responses for with this. But what are some of your hobbies outside of medicine? Um, so um, right now, my hobbies obviously are a little bit hampered, but um, I'm, a, I'm a giant basketball fan. And um, so for about eight years. I, I was in Ohio for, for 10 years um, in training and working um, before I moved to Indiana. I've been in Indiana, uh, back in Indiana for about three months now, but um, I really enjoy basketball. And so one of the things that I did to keep busy was I, I refereed high school basketball for about uh, six years. Um, I don't know if I'm going to do that again, but uh, hopefully uh, I'll get to a place where I can watch a lot of, a lot more basketball. Um, now that I'm back in the, back in the Mecca of basketball. Um, yeah. And, so, uh, and I'm just curious, Dr. Harrison, are you, are you getting that? Is, is your, your job that's keeping you pretty busy? I know your, your trauma and things like that, but I know not only me, but a lot of people kind of always say to themselves like, man, I really like trauma, but it's the lifestyle uh, that, that, that kind of worries them. Do you think there's any any truth to that or, you know, do you have to kind of go into it knowing you're going to be pretty busy a lot of the time? Yeah. So um, interestingly, I, I did a trauma fellowship in, uh, at Ohio State. I, I did a trauma. Um, I worked as a trauma subspecialist, but at IU, I actually have a, a general practice. Um, so I do a little bit of everything now. And my practice is, I'd say it's about 85 percent fractures, but um, I, I do a lot of other stuff. And I think that trauma can be a very busy life. If you go into a place where maybe you work with five or six other trauma people and, you, um, and you're and you at a super busy level one trauma center, mm -hmm. um, then you're gonna work a lot. But you may also find that trauma can be a life where um, you have a, you know, if you're in a large practice, you may share a call with uh, all of your partners who, uh, cover at night and tee things up for you the following day and, um, and you just work during daylight hours unless it's your turn to be on call. Um, so every every place is a little bit different to be honest. Um, it, 
you can have a you can have a rough trauma life or you can have an easy trauma life depending on how on how your practice is set up yeah yeah and i'm glad you just mentioned that because uh, a lot of people again they they seem to think trauma is they just have no life but i'm glad that you just um shed light that it's kind of all depending on how you have it set up is how your lifestyle will be yeah um but- yeah so let's uh let's go ahead and, and move into the case for the day and, and kind of the talk for the day we're going to talk about femoral neck fractures and so kind of a case that we just made up that we have for you here is say you're on call and you know you have a 68 year old male who presents to the ed after being sustaining a uh, ground level fall uh, no significant past medical history besides hypertension or diabetes um, was a community ambulator prior to this event and the ed calls they say you have a femoral neck fracture where what are you going to do like what are some things that you want to be on the lookout for regarding taking a history and doing a physical exam for this patient since we're talking about trauma we know that um all of our evaluations start with a right um everybody gets the uh everybody gets a trauma workup if appropriate and um geriatric patients even with ground level falls probably deserve trauma workups because uh, they can have other associated injuries um, head bleeds or um, you know other fractures in other places Uh, maybe not exactly like the mvc but um, geriatric patients deserve trauma workup even with some lower energy injuries because they have so many other associated um, issues at times. So everybody starts with A. And then um, after your primary survey is satisfied, then um, go through that uh, secondary survey and, and, you know, look at all the extremities, make sure you're not missing anything. And when you're done making sure you haven't missed something, focus on the obviously deformed extremity and, and have a look. Um, Pet peeve of mine, if a, if a leg is short and externally rotated and you had a, uh, and you had x-rays, um, we don't need to log roll them. Uh, it's one of my one of my favorite grumbles when I get a presentation for a patient that uh, has an obvious an obvious hip injury, and and they tell me that the log roll hurt. Well, of course it did because it's broken. Um, right. But an appropriate workup and a neurovascular workup, and uh, make sure the skin is intact and all those sorts of things. So, absolutely, yeah, I, I agree with you there. It's like sometimes you don't have to. <laughs> Don't have to put them through extra pain just, be, just, just, just because, right? Yeah, no um, reason to walk up to them and bang them on the back when you know their back's already broken. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so say, you know, we have a pretty good idea of what's going on with this patient. We see them in, in, the, uh, in the ED. And what's the next step as far as imaging? What's, what's the imaging that you want to get for this patient? Um, so right now you showed me an AP of the hip. Uh, pelvis X-rays are important, so we can see what uh, so we can see what their normal hip morphology looks like. Um, everybody's hips a little bit different. I I know we'll go into some of that anatomy here as we go, but um, you really want to see what that other femoral neck looks like so that you have an idea of what normal is for this patient. Um, looks like there is. A, looks to me like this is a more basal cervical um, type of injury so um, a little bit more i would personally treat this a little bit more um, as an extracapsular fracture Um, you see a little bit of greater trochanter involvement as well on that x-ray the lateral view is going to be really important to understand what's going on in the in the a to p plane when when it's time for us to get a good fracture reduction um, and if we aren't sure, I think a, a shout out, first of all, to the, uh, to the gravity or to the gravity stress, that's not necessary. <laughs> um, a, sh- a shout out to the, uh, traction x-ray, uh, is really important. That'll help us understand exactly what this fracture pattern is. Yeah. You can't I get like that, that or you try that and it's still not, uh, doesn't give you enough information to be comfortable. Then a CT scan is always, a uh, is always appropriate when you don't when you don't understand the fracture pattern yeah and just to kind of sum that up so again we want x-rays of the of the fractured hip you want an ap pelvis you want to assess uh, um, the other the contralateral femoral neck Um, you know we typically sometimes get a a whole of course a x-ray of the femur 
the, the entire femur. Um, and then, so you also said, you know, you sometimes you get a CT scan. So what, are, what, in what cases are you getting a CT scan? Are you getting it for every case or somewhere it's kind of like a questionable, um, questionable femur displacement or when are you getting a CT scan? For me, a CT scan is helpful when I don't fully understand the fracture pattern. If I see, um, you know, it looks like maybe there's some, and we're, we're trying to decide, is this really displaced or is this um, impacted and the lateral view doesn't help, for example? Um, or is this, you know, is this basicervical or is it a transcervical fracture? Where does it fall? I think that's helpful. Um, and then sometimes, you know, this CT scan you're showing has a little bit of uh, a little bit of arthritic change in the hip. Um, if, if you're worried that there might be a cyst or you're worried about some potential um, pathologic fracture, uh, then I think CT can help in that, those settings as well. What if, um, I guess, what, in what settings are you thinking about doing a MRI to, to kind of zone in on these types of fractures as well? Sure, so to me, the MRI is helpful um, in two settings. Number one, they have normal x-rays and can't bear weight. So that patient to me deserves an MRI to rule out a stress fracture. Um, and then the other patient that I, I think an MRI is really helpful for is in the greater trochanter fracture. Um, when you see a greater trochanter fracture and the patient doesn't want to bear weight, um, we really should be suspicious of a, a cult intertroch fracture. Um, and so those are the two settings when I, when I like to use MRI. And then I, I guess the last one would be um, sometimes in the in tumor workup as well. You can ah, makes perfect sense. So if there's a greater choke fracture, you want to be on the lookout for an occult intertroch fracture. If somebody's having uh, pain and x-ray films are normal, you really can't notice anything. And then if they're having a, you know, if you're doing some type of tumor oncological workup, those are times you may consider an MRI um, for these types of injuries. Uh, I think we did a good job talking about the imaging. We spoke about the x-rays to get, you know, you always want to examine both femoral necks, examine the joint above and below. Um, and of course, assess for any type of displacement, or AP or lateral. But so once we have our x-rays and we know it's a femoral neck fracture, how do we go about classifying, um, you know, these different femoral neck fractures? I know there's a lot of different classification systems, but uh, can you kind of run us through, because you kind of mentioned Basie cervical a little bit earlier, but can you kind of run us through different types of classification systems and how, and kind of like what those mean? Yeah, sure. So um, I think understanding the uh, anatomic region where the fracture is, is going to be really important. So it, it, is it a, a subcapital fracture that maybe uh, it's a little bit displaced, but you feel like you're going to have some difficulty uh, reducing it, or you're not going to have good purchase with screws? Um, if you're thinking about fixing it, that's going to that's a time where understanding where the fracture is is, is going to make a, a big difference for you. Um, and then when you're getting into transcervical versus basal cervical, now you're wondering. Um, about the blood supply to the femoral head, and you may make some uh, some different um, you may make some different treatment options based upon uh, based upon the actual location of the fracture. So I think thinking about it in anatomic terms is a perfect first start. Um, and then you have uh, obviously gardens classification, which is probably the um, Probably the most well known, but also probably the uh, most slippery slope to use um, when you're trying to think about femoral neck fractures. I think that probably one and four are uh, pretty self-explanatory, although even at, even at one, sometimes you're really sort of wondering, is this truly valgus impacted? Um, so. I think that relying solely on garden can be um, can be a little a little tricky sometimes unless it's just clearly displaced and then well does it matter if it's incompletely displaced or completely displaced maybe in some scenarios if they're a younger patient um, that might matter but a lot of times with geriatric patients 
that you got two options. Is it undisplaced or is it displaced? And then your treatments are going to be based on based on that. Um, stable versus unstable fracture patterns. Um, again, sort of just try to take garden and simplify it a little bit. Um, those impacted fractures are stable. And maybe you think about uh, fixation for those in unstable, uh, more displaced. Now we're starting to, to change our treatment options and go from fixation to um, arthroplasty. Um, PALS is important when you start talking about higher energy fractures and understanding why we treat higher energy fractures the way we do. So those ones and twos, those lower angle fractures, um, we can put screws in and we can get screws that go across the fracture line and don't have to worry about the shear forces that might cause displacement. Whereas when you have those uh, type threes, when you get 70 degree or higher, um, high energy femoral neck fractures, well, we really have to understand that fracture and um, think about the biomechanics of our fixation so that we don't end up with uh, the femoral head just falling off of our screws. So I think PALS is important for that reason and really thinking about how we treat our higher energy level fractures. Yeah, and, and, and back on the, the garden class of classification, uh, like you said, it, it is a bit uh, of a slippery slope. Another thing that I've kind of always thought about or uh, I've heard talked about at different uh, trauma meetings and things like that, it, it doesn't really take into effect the, the lateral of the, um, of the femoral neck fracture as well. I mean, it's mostly you're just kind of looking at it on the AP and uh, I know a lot of the people are starting to talk more about like posterior rollback and things like that and how that plays into things. So something else to uh, kind of keep in mind. Uh, but since this one is so, you know, a little bit more high yield and a lot of times med students are getting asked about this, can, can we just go through the different classifications one by one? Yeah, sure. Um, so garden one is the, is the, valgus in practice fracture. So it's, you know, that um, superior cortex is, is kind of found its way um, in, it's, it's impacted. <laughs> um, and so you're gonna see that the medial cortex may not even have, may not even have involvement, although um, I think it doesn't always end that way, but these are those sort of, maybe another way to think of it is garden one is kind of like the, the um, buckle fracture of the, of the hip is kind of the way I like to think about it a little bit. Um, once you see your fracture line go all the way through, um, but maybe it, it doesn't really seem displaced, those trabecular lines um, are, are collinear and they're, you, they seem to go in their normal pattern from inferior to superior. Um, these are fractures that you are trying, starting to think, um, well, we can probably fix this um, and it may not require much work um, to do. Once you get to garden three, it's somewhat displaced. Um, and so this is where I, th I think your point with the, um, with the lateral view is really important and we have to kind of extrapolate the garden classification a little bit into looking at that lateral view and saying, well, how displaced is it actually? Um, if you take the, the uh, AP and the lateral views. And I think a lot of times what you find when you look at both views is this isn't a garden three, um, this is a garden four. Um, so garden threes are a little bit unicorn fracture patterns in, in my opinion, or I don't tend to I tend to sort of skip past them a little and, and think about those threes more like completely displaced fractures, especially in really elderly patients, because um, I think the recovery is just easier on the arthroplasty side than it is on the fixation side. Um, but for, for completeness sake, once you start to see those trabecular lines get displaced and, and um, the femoral neck isn't, isn't lined up from along your along your Shinton's line or along those cortices, then you, we have displaced fracture. And then the four 
those are completely displaced fractures and they're usually pretty pretty easy to identify yeah and i, I think it's good that you uh, mentioned looking on the two different views because you can get fooled and i know for a fact that i've being fooled before and I've texted attendings a picture and I'd say, hey, you know, it's not just plays. I think we can probably do a couple pins in it and then I'll come back and like, did you look at this lateral? It's completely displaced. It needs a total hip. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. well, all right, well, uh, maybe I need to sit back and look through these images a little bit more. So uh, just to, just to reiterate the fact that you should look for it on the uh, AP and the lateral, use all your films to help clue you in. Yeah. Um, and one more thing, you kind of mentioned a little bit about the subcapital versus basic cervical. What does that have to do as far as you're saying with your subcapital, you may have to think that you may not be able to get as much fixation across a fracture, uh, across a fracture line. Is that some of the things in, in basic cervical? I, say, I heard you were saying you could kind of treat it like it's an extra capsular um, fracture. I know we'll talk about that here in a bit, but. Yeah, so. You got, when you're thinking about the, the options that are available to you, if you're going to use, um, if you're going to use partially threaded screws to uh, compress across a, fra a fracture, you got 16 and you got 32 millimeter threaded screws. Um, and so you really got to look at those subcapital fractures sometimes and say, if I use my 16 millimeter partially threaded screw, is that gonna, are those threads gonna be fully across my fracture line? Or do I not have enough bone purchase to put screws in? Um, and so sometimes that might drive me to think about a different way to treat those subcapital fractures. If I don't think my, my partially, or my screw threads are gonna go completely across, um, completely across the fracture and I don't, I don't think that all of your screws have to be partially threaded screws, um, and maybe none of them do, uh, but if you want good compression, I probably at least one of them has to be that way. And if you don't think you have enough purchase in the head for your screws, uh, then you might not wanna think about fixation. You might wanna start thinking about arthroplasty instead. Uh, um, okay. And then the basis cervical fractures, I. Those are, in my mind, those are intertrope fractures. Um, and so uh, they're really hard intertrope fractures. Um, but I, those are, I'm gonna think about nailing or um, a sliding hip screw type construct with basically cervical fractures instead of, instead of screws or uh, most of the time arthroplasty. Okay. And, and we touched base on the pile of classification, you know, you're talking about it has to do with the orientation of the fracture line. If it's, you know, up to 30 degrees, it's type one, 30 to 50 is a type two, and greater than 50 is a type three. And we always hear about the greater, uh, the more vertical, the fracture line, the, the more unstable, uh, you know, the more unstable that the fracture is. Is there any, any, anything else you care to add or, regarding that Powell's classification? Um, no, I, I mean, I think that's it. The, the only other thing that I think should be, um, should be thought about, and this may not be appropriate for this, um, for this talk, but those type threes, they're really hard to see. So, you know, anytime you go to a trauma meeting or if you see a high energy femoral shaft fracture, you know, we're all wringing our hands and spending all this time talking about the, um, talking about the unidentified femoral neck fracture. And part of the reason that, that they're so hard to see is because they're usually these higher PALS angle fractures. And it's really hard to get an x-ray beam to see that fracture line. So we really have to have a high level of suspicion when we have, you know, high energy femoral shaft fractures and we're, we're trying to not be the person who missed the ipsilateral femoral neck fracture. Yep. And I say like in my, like you say in high energy, so it's something that this classification seems to come into play a whole lot more with the younger uh, the younger population when they come in with these uh, femoral neck injuries. So I'm glad that we did mention it. Another, I think it's another high yield 
uh, another high yield, uh, you know, topic. And like you say, you probably can talk a whole lot more, uh, especially with like the type three on different ways to treat them and different things like that. Or if you get a non-union and things like that. So, but maybe, maybe for another day, uh, moving on to just some of the high yield anatomy that you should know about the, for more next. Can you, can we speak on some of that as well? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I, th I think this femoral neck angle is something, something that we don't necessarily talk a lot about, but it's something that you can really, um, you can really think a lot about when you're trying, uh, when you're treating these injuries. Um, as you have up on your, on your screen, 130 to 135, that's our normal angle. And that's where, that's where probably, you know, if you're not in a, uh, if you're not in a really busy uh, trauma center, that might be what you have from an, from an implant standpoint, if you're talking about sliding hip screws or, um, or femoral nails, they, may, they probably have a 135 degree neck angle implant. Um, and for a lot of people, that's okay. But if you have somebody who has that higher angle, um, that valgus neck, um, it's really important to kind of, it's one of the reasons why it's important to look at the other side, because then you may need to talk to your rep ahead of time and say, hey, um, in my slide and hip screw, um, do I have a 140 neck angle? Um, or did you bring the 140 um, plates? Because they may not bring them with them every time. Mm -hmm. And if you have something that matches that normal anatomy for that person, then it's going to be a lot easier to get that ever important uh, tip apex distance when you're trying to uh, when you're trying to get good fixation and prevent cutout. So I think thinking about yeah, 130 is normal, but not everybody's 130. Um, some people are going to be 140, and some people are going to be 120. Um, and understanding the implant systems that you use and what you have available to you to fix these fractures will make it a lot easier if you've thought about that ahead of time. Uh, the, uh, the other one that I think is, is good to think about is your antiversion. So these, um, the femoral head is antiverted, it's supposed to be that way. And if you're fixing a fracture and you're looking at your lateral view and you don't, and you don't see that antiversion, you don't see um, a good anterior scallop on your femoral neck, then you, you've probably malreduced your femoral neck. So I think it's, it's really important to think about it in that, in that setting to, to understand. Um, another thing to sort of help you cheat with your, with your version, your varus valgus, is to sort of look at where the head is in relationship to the trochanters. Um, and trying to match that side to side can help you be a quick view of what your, uh, what your femoral neck angle is doing. Right, right. Yeah, I think those are all uh, important points and definitely remembering, you know, basic anatomy and using that to help kind of guide your implant choice, especially with these, you know, you don't, this may be an over-exaggeration, but if you had a plate that was 150 degrees and somebody had a femoral neck angle that's maybe 125, it may not be the, the right implant for that patient. So I definitely see where that can come into play. Um, can you kind of touch a little bit, just a quick base on some of the trabecular lines and, you know, one of the things I know we kind of hear about like the sing index um, sometimes. Any, any importance of that for regarding like femoral neck fractures? Yeah, I, mean, I to me, I think the one thing that I really think about when I see this is these trabeculae can, can give you um, a little bit of an indication for the, the health of the bone, first of all. Um, but second of all, they can be that sort of second cortical line to help you see where your, where your, where your um, fracture fragments are lined up. So is the neck lined up with the, uh, with the inner trunk region or the subcapital region. So to me, they're sort of a helpful read here and there. I don't know that we really get too, too into the weeds with these seeing indexes very frequently, but I guess it's a, uh, the, the more rare, the more rare, or the more information that's available, the easier it is to write a question about, I guess. So. Right. And, um, and, and we know one of the big things about the femoral neck is kind of like the blood supply and, 
you know, it's a big, um, uh, you know, distinction, like whether it's, you know, intracapsular versus extracapsular and the importance of that and, and how it, you know, plays into non-unions. Can you kind of just go over the, the blood supply for the femoral neck and why this is important in these types of fractures? Yeah, sure. So um, I think, I think you hit on it. Once you, you have the, you have the two medial, the two circumflex, the medial and lateral circumflex. We know that a large portion of that blood supply um, comes off of that lateral circumflex. It's sort of newer information, I guess. Um, but after we get off of those circumflex arteries, we're really dealing with a pretty, um, a pretty small and tenuous blood supply. So you see all those, all those uh, small vessels that kind of rise up the neck there, um, penetrate the capsule and, and supply the head. For adults, we've lost, the, we've lost that ligamentum blood supply. That's not really, that's not really anything in, in an adult. So um, the blood vessels are small, they're easy to kink, um, if the fracture is displaced for a significant amount of time or you have something associated with a, uh, with a dislocation, then, then we know that the, those, blood, those blood supply becoming uh, disrupted is highly likely in that femoral neck region. Um, and I, I think it's, it's the, just to correct myself, it's the lateral aspect of the medial circumflex, right? Like you have on your, uh, like you have on your, uh, screen so yeah. I think that's what makes it that's what makes it tricky is the, it's the lateral part, portion of the medial circumflex so if you're first starting to take exams then they I don't know they just try to confuse you just, just trying yep. to trick us <laughs> yep that's just uh just like you say just a way to trick you on, on the, the anterior questions. branch of the lateral aspect of the medial circumflex right? yeah, they, they yeah. Just use all directions <laughs> so and probably getting to the more of the meat here, even though we've had a, quite a bit of good discussion here. What's, I guess we can start with non-operative treatment for these. And who would, uh, what would be some of the indications for non-operative management and what, what would that include? So it, to me, the non-operative indications of hip fractures are pretty limited. Um, if a patient walks in on a valgus impacted fracture, that's been there for three weeks and you can really delineate the timeline um, and you and you really feel like that valgus impacted fracture is stable then I think toe touch weight bearing for a few weeks and if they can limit it is fine um, the second the second thing is if you um, you know you talk to your medicine colleagues and they say anesthesia is going to kill this patient then obviously um, Obviously, that patient shouldn't be in the operating room. Right. Um, but aside from that, you know, fresh, uh, even fresh valgus impacted fractures. If a patient can tolerate, um, if a patient can tolerate surgery, they can get three screws and then they can be weight bearing as tolerated. Yeah. So it, whatever we can do, especially in geriatric patients, um, whatever we can do to allow them to weight bear as tolerated, we should. We should really do, um, and, and we can talk about this as we go, or um, maybe I'll mention it right now. But even one of my most favorite recent papers is a paper describing outcomes of uh, hip fracture fixation in um, in patients in hospice, and actually the patients that had fi fixation lived longer. So you know, even patients that we might consider shouldn't shouldn't get surgery because they're not going to live for very long or whatever. Um, whatever we can do to let them have some pain-free life that they can weight bear as tolerate on their extremity, I think is super important. Yeah, I need to I need to look that article up. Um, I think that'd be an interesting read to um, to take a look at, and I didn't even know that, but yeah, that's that's definitely interesting. Um, now, those, as far as non-operative treatment, right, those are the ones that we may have total touch weight bearing, but likely for most of these, we're going to try to stabilize them in some type of way. That way they can go ahead and start weight bearing and get, um, get their mobility back. So I know there's a lot of different treatment options. You know, you can do closed ducts and percutaneous pinning, you can do hip screws, nails, total hips. 
But I kind of just like to start off by talking about how, what are some different ways that we can treat our non-displaced uh, femoral neck fractures and then some of the pearls that we need to know when we're treating these uh, non-displaced uh, femoral neck fractures and how you go about it. What implants do you use? Sure. So I, I, mean, I think what you got on your, on your slide is perfect. It's, you can use the cannulated screw systems. You can use the sliding hip screw devices. Um, no financial conflicts here, but um, there's a new femoral neck system created by Synthes, which is a, um, a pretty easy device to use um, that can allow some compression. So there's even some newer, um, there's some newer devices on the, uh, on the market that are available to us, but three screws or, or a sliding hip screw are uh, tried and true methods of fixing these and, and are appropriate. Um, you, you're, you're asking about the close reduction technique. I like using a fracture table. Um, I like a HANA table. It, it keeps the leg out of that well position that you might see um, on more traditional uh, fracture tables. Um, it allows for traction and turn rotation to, to, to dial in the, to dial in the reduction, I think is good. Um, on flat Jacksons, if you have a completely non-displaced fracture, you do not need, um, you probably don't need to have a, uh, you don't need to have a fracture table, but it does limit your, your imaging sometimes. Yeah. So I think you have to really kind of think about your patient and um, it works pretty well on a, on an easy to easy to image patient to just have them flat and not use your, your choice of fracture uh, um, table. So what are some of the, I know you just said you use it, you know, you use a HANA table, or, you know, that fracture table. Um, so when you're going to go and you, you found a patient that has this valgus impacted uh, femoral neck fracture, when you go for closed reduction percutaneous pinning, now you just said in order to sometimes get your, your reduction, you may do a little traction and internal rotation. Uh, can you kind of talk about closed reduction and percutaneous pinning, you know, what size screws you're using, and then I guess some, just some pearls as far as making sure you have a, a good stable construct? Yeah. Um, so like you said, fracture table, good reduction. Always be ready to sort of think about that antiversion. So, you know, sometimes in order to supplement that antiversion, you might need to make a small, um, you might need to make a small a small incision anteriorly and use, um, and use something to kind of help you dial in that antiversion to make that look good. Um, if you are looking at, uh, for example, some of the uh, some of the implants uh, systems have these aiming devices that they um, that they sell with their in their sets. Um, I take that thing and throw it far away or hide it from people <laughs> to use it. Because um, really, the, if you're going to go for that inverted triangle configuration, which we all know that that's what studies have shown is is the strongest biomechanically the spread of those screws is important. So in your image that you have here, I really like this inferior screw. It's along the cow car. Um, notice I was talking about screw links earlier. Um, I tend to choose the, the, shorter, the shorter threads um, because then I know that I, this, this screw is coming up against that fracture line. So if I, my threads can all be on the other side of the fracture line, that's important. Um, and then I like to take these superior screws and bring them a little bit higher up on the neck there. And okay. then when you look at your lateral view, they're going to be hugging both of those cortices. So that inferior screw, that's keeping your uh, fracture from falling into varus. And then your two superior screws. And to me, I, having them perfectly parallel is not important. Um, having them close is good, but having them perfectly parallel is not important. Having them really hug those um, hug those cortices in the anterior and posterior neck are really going to help you from falling forwards or backwards um, as you you know you think about the the pencil sitting in the in the in the cup or whatever with 
without much bone in that in the middle of the neck. The other sort of tip that I think is there's only so many times you can do this. So if you've passed a wire 70 times to do this, you've probably taken any trabecular bone that exists in that femoral neck and you've, you've poked holes in it. Right. So that's one of the reasons why I say, you know, don't try to make it perfect. Don't try to make those two superior screws perfectly lined up with one another. You're just going to poke holes in the bone and you're going to, you're going to, risk it falling apart. Um, screw sizes, I usually use 6.5 millimeter screws. Yep. Uh, any thoughts on partially threaded versus fully threaded screws? Um, so I think that especially that Calcar screw, that inferior screw, a partially threaded screw is good because it's going to give you your compression. Mm -hmm. um, for the other two, partially threaded can be okay if you need compression in those areas. Uh, one of the things that I'll tend to do is if there's comminution along one of the necks, um, then I'll use a, a fully threaded screw. So hopefully we don't over compress that comminuted segment. All right. Good to know all those little details that you have to kind of have in mind when you're about to go do one of these cases uh, and, and make sure, you know, you can make, make sure you keep things uh, simple. Uh, oh, one last thing. And as far as your starting point, um what's your is there like a level that you don't want to go further like no more inferior than when you get in your start starting point yeah so um excellent point and and um that inferior screw there you really want to keep that um above the lesser choke you don't want to create a stress riser that can lead to a fracture so um nothing there's no real limit superiorly except for if you go too far you're going to find yourself not in the neck but um, for that inferior screw, really make sure, I, I like to probably start, I don't know, this is a pretty perfect screw along the cow car, so I think it's probably in a good position. Yeah. But you don't want to go much lower than that, or else uh, you run the risk of uh, creating a stress riser. Awesome. And moving to the, the, next, uh, uh, the next type of fixation you can do, when, who's getting the dynamic hip screws? Um, for me... People getting dynamic hip screws are those uh, basic cervical fractures. I think that um, that the sliding hip screw is a perfect implant for that. Uh, younger patients um, uh, is a perfect e example or reason to think about a sliding hip screw. Um, if you believe the health trial, then smokers should probably get uh, sliding hip screws as opposed to three screws. Um, but those are my, uh, well, and then one other special population, your, your, um, your neck shaft combos are, are typically mm -hmm. getting sliding hip screws too. And you call you said the health trial, is that what you called it? Or it's not health. It's faith. <laughs> faith, faith? Is, faith is the fracture okay. fixation trial. Again, randomized, um, multinational. And what they did is they took patients um, and gave them either slide hip screw or cancella screws. Um, and the patients that had, uh, there was a higher risk of avascular necrosis, necrosis in sliding hip screws. Um, so, you know, you, if you're thinking really? about your younger patients, you want to sort of be aware of that. You're putting a big hole in the femoral neck. And then there was an increased risk of failure in patients with cancella screws um, who were smokers. Hmm. Well, that's so a good one. If you're thinking between the two, um, you might want to uh, consider one or the other. They also found that displaced fractures did better with sliding hip screws. So for younger, younger patients that you that you're, want to fix, then you may want to consider that sliding hip screw um, implant but you have to think about, you're also going to have to be really aware of a vascular necrosis because that's a higher risk with that implant. Right. Um, okay. And so you're saying you'd use, you know, this DHS in your, you know, your, your basic cervical, and, you know, femoral neck fractures. Um, and then you had to be cautious about, you know, using it in those patients that you were just talking about, possibly younger patients, you may have, you know, increased AVN. Uh, but can you can you explain 
because it took me a while to understand it, I guess when I was first starting out, um, the actual like mechanism between this sliding hip screw and why it's called a sliding hip screw and like why it's a good construct for these femoral neck fractures. Yeah, so, so you, you have that large screw that you put up into the femoral head through the neck um, and then you put that, and then you put the barrel over top of it, right? So that screw can piston within that barrel. Now, some of the newer implants, you can actually turn that into a fixed angle device so you can really limit that pistoning between there. Um, but if you think about those, those fractures, by weight bearing on the extremity, you're allowing a controlled collapse, you're allowing some of that pistoning to occur, and then you're creating compressive forces across the fracture, which should help it, which should help it heal. Mm. Um, but it's one of the reasons why you have tip apex distance up there. It's why tip apex distance is so important, right? Because you have to have enough stable fixation inside the femoral head to allow that process to occur and not have the, the screw cut out. If you don't have sufficient fixation, as that process is occurring, that pretty sharp um, screw, or you can use a blade with some of the, uh, you can use a blade with some implants, some companies' implants. It's just gonna rip right out of that femoral head, um, and then you're left with a bigger problem than you were started with, than you started with. Okay. All right. Can you, can you just quickly touch on what the tip, the apex distance is? Yep. So thanks to Dr. Bumgardner. Um, the tip apex distance is going to be the distance between the tip of the screw and the center of the femoral head on the AP and the lateral views. So when we're talking about these center center screws in this example, um, it's nicely in the center on this AP view. Um, you could probably spare to go a little bit deeper in the head if you wanted to. Um, Although I bet when you look at the lateral view, these are this is going to be a really nice tip apex distance. So less than 25 is the number that you're shooting for. In all honesty, the number closest to zero that you can get to is the number that you're shooting for. The good bone is that subchondral bone. So if you can get that screw to fixate into that good, strong subchondral bone, your risk of cutout of that implant is next to zero. Mm, so, so you want to get that screw and that good uh, and that good subchondral bone. Okay. Yep, absolutely. And if you look back at Bumgardner's paper, um, the the really really low tip apex distances had zero cutout at all. So um, it doesn't need to be it probably doesn't need to be five, but if you can get ten to fifteen, that's a really uh, that's a really good number to hit to to shoot for. Okay, and. Leading to the the next uh, type of fixation, who's getting uh, arthroplasty as far as when we go between hemis and totals? Sure. So to me, arthroplasty is dependent upon the the patient's functional status up to up to an age. So it, you know the patients that are patients that are let's say less than fifty. They're getting every attempt at fixation that I can that I can give them. Um, once we get 50 to 65, if they have a completely displaced fracture um, and they are healthy, fully mobile, you know, contributing members of society still, then I think they deserve a um, a total hip arthroplasty. Kind of like kind of like the population, you know, when you're thinking about when is it time for a patient with arthritis to get a total hip? Um, that's sort of, those are sort of some of the cutoffs that you might, that you might think about. So, and then when you get up in the 80 year olds and 90 year olds, to me, um, unless they're, unless they are really, really just, you know, active, they are walking 15, 20 miles a day or they're doing something, like those patients are going to do really, really well with a, Hemi arthroplasty. This was actually a question on the recent OITE. It was an 80 year old male uh, who they said it was an active 80 year old male and uh, said active 80 year old male and says he wants to get back to 
uh, golf. Oh, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. It was just on the <laughs> test just yeah. the other day. And you know what? Because I spent probably more time than I thought I would have spent on that question. So, <laughs> uh you know, and I just felt like he is really old. Like, I mean, I, I understand you trying to tell me that he is active. And I don't think they gave you a x-ray. So you couldn't say that he had, like, arthritis no. pre previously or anything like that. But, it didn't. Uh, you know, and it, it really did. It asked, would you go with the total versus the uh, hemiarthroplasty? Uh, what, what would you do if, if that was your – well, you know what? Let's say if you were taking a test, because sometimes what you might do – in office might be a little bit different than taking the test. So an 80 year old golfer, uh, yeah. we would probably have a serious conversation about a hip arthroplasty. Yeah. Um, so I, that's, that question is probably sourced off of one paper, right? Um, and I, I don't know about a paper with, <laughs> I'm trying to think if I, there was, there was recently one about golf and total knees improving your, improving your um, handicap, but I don't know one about hip replacement. There is, so in front of me, I have the health trial, which um, health was a, another randomized multi-center trial looking at hip fractures and looking at um, hemiarthroplasty versus total hip arthroplasty, patients greater than 50. Um, and there's higher dislocation rates in patients that have total hip arthroplasty, which I think we would all understand. Um, but the functional scores favor total hip over HEMI. So, HEMI, yeah. That probably they were pointing you towards total hip, but I, I mean, every time I try to answer those questions, I end up getting them wrong. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought <laughs> it was pretty too. tough too. I thought it was pretty tough because I, in my mind, I'm like, they're really, I, I think they're really trying to push towards a total hip. Like that's why they put it here. But I mean, he is 80 years old. Yeah. But I, you know, maybe his phys physiologic age is, you know. 55 i don't know yeah anyway well, i'm not i'm not gonna say what i chose until i, I see what, what my score is you're free to leave that all the time uh, just like voting it's your own uh, <laughs> it's, your, it's your own personal decision absolutely um, but you know it is i i think you bring up a really really important point like age really isn't the answer mm -hmm. right it's it's really their functional status because you can have you can have 10 65 year old patients walk into your emergency department with a displaced total or with a displaced femoral neck fracture, right? And one of them can play 72 holes of golf in a weekend and be completely healthy. The next one could be 20, or I said they were all 65. The next one can have poorly controlled diabetes and have a hemoglobin A1C of 15. Mm. And, you know, the next one can um, sit at home all day and only read the paper. And the next one can um, have horrific coronary artery disease and bad aortic stenosis you know so right the age is is not is not the most important thing when you're trying to figure out what to do with these patients yeah and i feel like that may have been what that question was trying to get at and like i say i'm not gonna say my answer because <laughs> just, just, just go ahead and save it <laughs> they didn't get you into cement or uncemented did they no they didn't and uh yeah i was I had, I was thinking to myself about that because it they asked a few questions about like uh, hemis and things like that and I'm like uh oh uh, so <laughs> what 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 do you, what are your thoughts about that on the hemi arthroplasty or I guess uh, maybe total as well yes. ver cement versus uncemented uh, prosthesis you're sick enough from to have a hemi arthroplasty you deserve a cemented 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 if there's one thing that the literature kind of tells us rather convincingly, it's that hemiarthroplasty should be a cemented procedure. The outcomes and the risks of fracture are really high when it comes to using cementless. And I, I know that uh, you'll find a lot of people who will tell, um, will tell stories about 
cementing total or hemiarthroplasties and then patients having um, a cardiac event. Um, I think you got to be really careful about it. You got to be smart about your cementing technique. Um, it still could happen, uh, but the outcomes and your risk of fracture down the line are really high and sick patients need one surgery. So the more surgeries you have to do on them, the higher their risk of complications down the line, the higher the risk of infection uh, and all those sorts of things that can lead to really bad outcomes. So I'm a cementer. Um, I like to tell people I'm the captain of team cement when it comes to him and orthoplasty. <laughs> and uh, you know, you'll, you'll find people, you may have some attendings where you guys are that, uh, that feel really strongly about it in other ways. Right. Um, when it comes time to doing, when it comes time to doing the um, total hip arthroplasty, I, I think it depends on age. You know, those 80 year olds with type C femurs, so those stove type pipe, those stove type, stove um, pipe type femurs, uh, I, I think you really should think about cementing um, those. You really just kind of have to look at their um, look at their bone and, and think about what their bone is like before you think about, you know, that wedge that you have there, that accolade or wedge type stem that's on in the middle of your uh, slide is, it, it is a wedge. <laughs> and so in poor bone, it will, um, it will do just the same thing that your ax will do to a piece of wood right. when you're, when you're cutting it. So you got to think about that. And, and there's one more category of, of patients that um, I just at least want to quickly touch on. And, and that's going to be the young patient with the displaced femoral neck fracture. Um, you typically, you know, most stuff we've read is, you know, you typically try to fix these in these young, in these young patients that may even require an open reduction. Uh, I guess from, from your standpoint, what's your experience on this? Um, I, I think let's say, you know, let's say you're, you're less than 50 and, and some people would even argue that 50 would be too young to think about this, but I think that a total hip replacement is such a good surgery that in completely displaced fractures, 50 and above, you can really have, a, you know, you can have the conversation with the patient. You can explain the two procedures and decide you, the two of you can decide together less than that. I'm really thinking about fixing. Um, and like you said, sort of if having the comfort level and the toolbox to do an open reduction is, is good. Um, you'll see some papers and, you know, there's some arguments out there that a closed reduction is just as good as an open reduction. Um, that's kind of hard to believe sometimes. And I've certainly had myself thinking that I had a good closed reduction and then something about it just didn't feel right and open it up to look at it and nope, it's way off. Um, so if you wanna be comfortable with a closed reduction, you have to have really high quality x-rays and you have to really believe what you're, what you're looking at. Uh, the youngest patient I've ever put a total hip replacement in was 16 years old. Uh -huh. um, and the reason they got a total hip replacement is because they got shot in their hip um, and they had a femoral neck fracture, but they also had a destroyed femoral head. Okay. So we didn't have a choice. Um, and that patient, you know, so far is doing amazing. You know, a patient after a total hip arthroplasty is going to do really well for a long time. But is that 16 year old uh, kid going to need another surgery in, in their lifetime? Most likely, right? Right. Whereas if you can fix the femoral neck and you don't get AVN and it heals, are they going to need another surgery in their lifetime? Well, maybe not. So if you can give them that, I, I think it's worth trying. Wow. Yeah. I think that was great. I think that was a great, excellent um, overview of, of how to kind of approach these, these young patients that have, you know, that are unfortunate enough to have these, um, displaced um, femoral neck fractures. And I think overall, I think this was a great talk on femoral neck fractures. We talked about, you know, the imaging on what to look for, different classification systems, and kind of walk through each of the uh, treatment options and the different, uh, the different devices or the different uh, uh, constructs that you can use to treat those. 
Now we're fortunate enough to have a, a couple of cases here um, by you that that you that you were so so graciously um, nice to share with us. And we would just want to take just a couple minutes to see if you can kind of just walk us through these cases, your thought process, and just uh, you know kind of just touch on the key aspects of the case um, that made that case uh, you know successful. Yeah. So. Um... I don't remember. I don't remember the patient's exact age, but this is somebody in their fifties who has, um, you know, sort of basi cervical slash um, trans cervical fracture here uh, that is varus displaced, right? So you can see that varus displacement in their in their fracture, um, and this is they're on the fracture table already. Um, so I think this, we don't really see the lateral view before traction, but really, I mean, it, it's hard to, it's hard to say that you shouldn't fix this particular fracture, right? Because if you, if you look at it, um, you can clearly see the anterior and posterior, um, uh, anterior and posterior aspects of the neck on that lateral x-ray. We're able to get a really nice picture and it's, it's um, anatomically reduced. Um, we've pulled it out of varus in that middle image there, and, and there's still a little displacement there, but I'm, I'm willing to leave that little bit of displacement right there um, because I know that I can compress that with my implant and I can get that um, squeezed down. I'd rather have a little bit of, a little bit of opening there and see my, my neck shaft angle in valgus than put that, squeeze that down before surgery and have a varus malreduction. Mal so um, in general, we were able to, I think, get a pretty nice, um, a pretty nice reduction in its traction. Um, and, and then they say on the laterals that you kind of want, want that kind of that S, you know, of the, of the necks, like kind of that S um, right. shape, I guess, to be recreated and that kind of will show you that you have a pretty, pretty good reduction here. And I think we have a continuation of the case. And actually, one, one quick second, because I actually think this is something that even for myself, I remember even as an intern, just recognizing where was anterior and where's posterior <laughs> yeah. when you're looking at these laterals. Yep. Uh, can we point that out too? Because honestly, I, I just saw someone get this wrong and uh, it's, it's definitely like worth worthwhile to, to mention it. So to me, somebody taught me a long time ago that the anterior is where the air is. So yeah, the, I like that. The left side of that image is your anterior um, neck. And then the most prominent thing in the posterior aspect of the, of the femur is the lesser trochanter. So where the lesser trochanter is, is the posterior aspect of your femoral neck. Um, so that's excellent thing to point out when you're, you know, when you're a young resident and you're trying to figure out what side's up, um, that air is where your anterior neck is. It's a good way to remember it. Yep. I like that. And then, so kind of just kind of walk us through, um, this reduction or this sequence of events here. Yeah. So, um, unfortunately I don't have a lateral view of this. I wish I did. Um, but I, I saved these three images. This is um, the Synthes Femoral Neck System. Again, they're not paying me anything to say anything nice about this system. <laughs> um, but you can see the compression that this system provides. So on the far left image, you can still see that gap. Um, and then in the middle, we've compressed it uh, a little bit. Um, and then in the far right image, you can see where we've um, pretty much completely reduce that fracture down on the um, on that medial cortex. So um, the device is, is, is pretty nice that it allows that sort of compression. Can you get that with a with three screws? Yeah, probably you can you know, you can do that with a nice partially threaded screw. Um, but this is this, uh, this implant, uh, I think in in good bone is a nice uh, is a nice option to use for yeah. uh, for femoral neck fractures. Like it, I think that was a great case there, um, showing us that kind of that compression and showing us how you got that reduction and getting the neck out of varus. Uh, can you kind of show us through what this image here is showing or what you're trying to um, show us with this? 
Yep. So, so um, this is a different femoral neck fracture. Mm -hmm. um, and we've uh, chosen to fix it with cannulated screws. And we're looking at that nice um, th spread of our, of our uh, pins that we've placed. So uh, the posterior neck is the left side of the screen and the anterior neck is the right side of the screen. Um, and you can see how we have uh, diverging screws or diverging pins at this point that really ride the, those anterior and posterior cortices. So you cannot do this with any device that um, is supposed to provide you with uh, is supposed to provide you with spacing of your screws. Some people might disagree with me, but I I don't think you can get this spread. Um, and this is what you're looking at. And if you had the if you have the AP view, those anterior and posterior screws, yeah, you can see they're you're pointing out they're not penetrating the femoral head, right. so that's important. Right. Um, you want to make sure right. that you, you're not penetrating the femoral head or potentially causing um, a risk for AVN. Um, Excellent. If you look at this on the AP view, those anterior posterior pins are not going to be, they're not perfect. Um, and I don't think it matters. I think that this spread is the most important thing. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. Great. Great. And, and then this is kind of, um, if you want to kind of walk us through this, yeah, uh, so this other case here. To me, this case is a bit of a, um, this case is a bit of a tweener, right? This is, um, it looks like it's it looks like it's a little bit impacted when you look at the lateral view we're, we're lucky to have a nice lateral view here but you see that there's comminution along the um, anterior neck so the right side of the screen is that anterior neck and you see that comminution there to me it makes me a little bit nervous it makes me um, want to talk to the patient and you know want to understand who they are and what they do and give them the option and say hey listen you can get fixation for this fracture. It could potentially fall apart. Um, if it does, you might require another surgery. Um, but really sort of, you can see on that right side, um, the two images on the right are our traction views before, um, our views before prepping and draping. And, and, and it's nicely reduced. We, that cow car um, is, um, is nicely recreated there. Um, and even with considering uh, the anterior comminution, that lines up okay. The, the head is not, the head is not um, posteriorly um, malreduced on the far right image. So the posterior segment there with a the lesser trochanter is it, we've been able to create some more of that antiversion in the head. And so this is, to me, this is reduced enough uh, that you can trial fixation. And we, you know, we've talked to the patient and we said, if we can't reduce it, you're getting a hemiarthroplasty, but we'll put you on the table and try it. And turns out we were able to make it look okay. And, and here's, a, here's an example of, if you look at those screws, so we used one partially threaded screw inferior to compress the inferior neck. And then we've used fully threaded screws in the superior screws um, to prevent over compression of that anterior fragment. Um, so the far right images are follow up images. And I think it moved a little bit, but I, it certainly didn't, it didn't completely fall apart. Um, it was, uh, it was fixed enough that it was, able to hang on and, and heal. And I think that getting the screws in the right position is, is helpful for that. Yeah, I think those are uh, both great cases. And we have a third one here. So this one, this is displaced. This is a good example of the completely displaced femoral neck fracture. Um, there's a giant gap sort of on that uh, lateral that lateral femoral neck there. Um, and then the, the lateral image doesn't project well. Sorry, I didn't send you a good picture. No, it's no worries. But it's, it's fallen off completely, right? The neck is in, or the neck shaft angle is severe varus. Um, 
and on the lateral, it doesn't appear to be anywhere in the right neighborhood. So this to me is an arthroplasty case for sure. Um, it's talking to patients about, uh, you know, it's learning about them and figuring out how old they are and how active they are and what their other medical comorbidities are. And then we can do, um, we can do some kind of arthroplasty procedure for yeah. them. Kind of looks like this is the, uh, this is a head here, kind of an outline. Yeah, I and think so. You don't have that kind of S shape that we're looking for, you know. Yeah, it's, it's just completely collapsed. So yeah. one thing I think that, I guess for completeness sake, we should mention that in, in a severely moribund patient that, you know, that is just going to lay in bed and truly never, you know, they get rolled for hygiene and that's it. Um, the other option to think about is, um, is um, resection arthroplasty or a girdle stone procedure. That is, if we wanna just say that we've talked about all the options, it's something that you can consider sometimes for patients um, or maybe in a patient that you know has had fixation or had an arthroplasty and they've had an infection issue or something like that. And they need another procedure for source control but don't necessarily need an implant. That's always a, a consideration, so for completeness sake. There it is. I think this was a, a great way to end the show. Uh, we went through a lot of high yield topics and I'm sure a lot of people learned a lot from it. And we really appreciate your time, Dr. Harrison. Um, before we go, we usually have asked, is there any way for our listeners to reach out to you if they, if they have any questions or just want to, uh, you know, possibly reach out to you and get to know you? Is there anything like any social media hand, handles or emails or anything like that? Um, for sure. So. Um... Social media, Twitter is um, RKH underscore MD. So if you, and if you look at my name, it'll show up there too. Um, I, I, Twitter is a lot of fun. I like the interaction that, um, that happens there. Um, so lots of conversations there. And then um, my email address, um, if you, you guys want to put my, um, do you guys want to put my Gmail address on this, on the slide, um, that I shared with you, um, R Y I U B zero five at Gmail, um, reach well, out then. anytime. Sounds good. We, uh, again, thanks so much for coming on and, and talking on the podcast about femoral neck fracture. I think it was really good and the people will enjoy it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Uh, definitely a, a fun topic to talk about and lots of, uh, lots of different ways that we can treat these injuries. So lots of fun.